Hello, I'm Mark Payne with the West Virginia Humanities Council. Welcome to History Alive. History Alive is a program of the Humanities Council that brings historical figures to life through first-person portrayals by presenters who have conducted thorough research into their character. The Humanities Council makes these characters available to both nonprofit and for-profit organizations across West Virginia. History Alive is designed as an interactive experience between the character and the audience. They are entertaining and educational. We encourage your organization, school, or event to host a presentation and bring a figure from history for a visit with your audience or students. Having someone like Harriet Tubman or Stonewall Jackson come to speak to your group can breathe life into these historical figures. Nothing compares to the live, in-person visit. Each presentation consists of three parts, a monologue, a question-answer session with the character, and then the presenter breaks character to answer questions about how he or she conducted their research. Our History Lab presenters have researched a variety of sources such as diaries, journals, letters, official documents, autobiographies, and the research of other scholars in developing their character. A History Lab presentation is not a play, it's an audience participation event that relies on interaction between the audience and the character. Being able to ask your own questions of these important figures from the past is a unique experience. It's difficult to reproduce the feel of an actual History Lab presentation here in the studio. Without an audience to ask questions, we'll change the format a bit and have our guests sit with me for a few questions after the monologue. But we hope to give a sample of how a History Lab presentation can add to your program offerings. There will be information on the, end of the, at, on the screen at the end of the program for how to contact the Humanities Council about bringing a History Lab character to your community. At this time, I would like to welcome today's guest from history. We are pleased to have with us in the studio, Nellie Bly. Energy rightly applied and directed can accomplish anything. That has been my motto my entire life, ever since I was a young child growing up in Apollo, Pennsylvania. But when the owner of the New York World newspaper, Joseph Pulitzer, asked me if I could feign insanity to get myself committed to Blackwell Island, insane asylum for women, having the authorities believe me to report the factual truth from inside, without guaranteeing that he could get me out. I didn't know if I could do it, but I couldn't let him believe that. You see, I had come to New York City wanting to set the world on fire. I had been working for the Pittsburgh Dispatch as one of the very first undercover investigative reporters. But of course, some of my reporting was about the working conditions for children and women in factories who were advertisers for the newspaper. So they put me on the women's section. I had to report about the theater openings and about the gardening. And I didn't like that. That's not what I wanted to do. So I left to go to Mexico, where I was a freelance reporter. So I thought that everybody in New York would have heard of me. But when I arrived, I found that was not the case, and I was having very difficulty even getting beyond the front desk. Well, the day that I finally made the decision that it was do or die, I was sitting in Central Park, and I had had my purse stolen with the very last cent I had in the world in it. So when Joseph Pulitzer asked me that, <laughs> I really didn't have a choice, now did I? I said I would, I could, and I did. I went home and stopped at the library on my way, picking up books that would talk to me about how insane people acted. And I practiced all night long in front of the mirror, keeping my eyes open, staring till they glazed over. And I read ghost stories so that I wouldn't even sleep all night. I made my way the next morning down to a boarding house for women, working women. They asked me my name, and I said my name was Nellie Brown. That was the name that I had decided upon with Mr. Pulitzer, so the initials were the same as my underwear, because by this time I was no longer known as Elizabeth Jane Cochran. I was known by my pen name, Nellie Bly. They needed to know who to ask for to get me out, so the name Nellie Brown was one we had decided on. Again, they didn't tell me they could get me out for sure. When I arrived there, I, I started saying everything was sad. I thought the women there were going to kill me. 
and I acted very strangely so that all the women were afraid to stay in my room that night, except one dear soul who said she would. I again stayed up all night long, and the next morning they took me down to the, the jailhouse, to the, the police department there, and after a very cursory uh, interview uh, where the doctor, he, he looked in my eyes, he took my pulse, he listened to my heart, and he asked me to stick my tongue out. That was, that was the entire medical examination. And the judge asked me a few questions too, but they soon deemed that I was insane. And after more rounds of questions later on, which I refused to answer, I found myself on a boat across the East River to Blackwell's Island Insane Asylum. That boat was fetid. On the mattress, there was vomit, there was human excrement. It was filthy. I met some women on that boat, Anne Neville, Mrs. Schantz, whose only crime was that she couldn't speak English. She spoke German, so couldn't answer the questions. Tilly Mayard, as well as Anne Neville, their only sign of insanity? Well, it was not really a sign. They had been ill, and their family could no longer pay for them to be in a hospital, so they put them in the insane asylum. When we entered there, there was a, a sign on the building that said, all who enter here while you live, you have hope. I realized it should have said, I'll go enter here, give up all hope, because it was a rat trap, a human rat trap, very easy to get into, but almost impossible to get out of. The conditions there were unbelievable. They had not turned the heat in on, though it was frigid outside. We were all told to strip off our clothes, and I refused because I'd never been naked in front of other women, but they said if I didn't, they would take them off of me. We were made to stand in line, and one by one, we were put into a metal bathtub. The same water never changed. There were women with open sores, with lice on their bodies. And when I got up to it, they t put me inside of it, and they had a metal brush that they were scrubbing me with, and it hurt so bad, I started to scream. And as I did, they poured bucket after bucket of water over me that I felt like I was going to drown. And I probably did look insane at that moment. But from the time I entered Blackwell's Island, I started acting normal, just my regular self. I put off the guise of being insane. And I told them, test me. I'm as sane as you are. And the doctor said, oh no, the nurses, you wouldn't be here if you weren't insane. Now what doctor who just in passing says hello to you can determine your sanity or treat you? We were made to sit on wooden benches from 8 a.m. till 6 p.m not giving permission to even go to the bathroom without them telling us when we could do it. I ask you, what healthy, sane woman who is made to sit from 8 a.m. till 6 p.m., day in and day out, given nothing to read, knowing nothing of the outside world, not being allowed to talk in those deplorable conditions where she has meager food, that is most of it rancid, she has kept in cold conditions. How long do you think it would take before she became insane? I give it two to three weeks tops. The matrons there, the nurses, they beat the patients. I have heard they murdered one of them by drowning. I saw them beat them with brooms, put them in closets, pull out their hair. I saw women standing, looking across at Manhattan. Heaven could not be farther than hell their salvation. So when I received word that a lawyer had arrived to get me out of there, I had mixed feelings because I felt sorry for them. I didn't want to leave them like this, but I knew that I could be their champion on the outside. I had been there 10 days by the time they were able to get my release. I immediately started writing a series of articles about my time there, and a grand jury was convened and Neville was found and brought in, and she corroborated everything that I had said in my articles. The grand jury, they wanted to see the conditions firsthand. When they got on the boat, it was a brand new, pristine, clean boat. So we knew right away they had been tipped off. They crossed over and landed on the island, and everything was clean. There were no more rats. They had taken the buckets out of our room and replaced them with basins. The food, white, fluffy bread, 
everything had changed, but yet they believed me. And because of that, $1 million was allocated for the treatment of the mentally ill. True to his word, Mr. Pulitzer made me a reporter. And I started writing the type of stories that I really wanted to write. So I uncovered corruption, not only in industry, but also in government, of lobbyists, in children's adoptions, um, matchmaking companies, unemployment agencies. These were the types of things I investigated, but not everything I did was so serious. I, I was hired on as a tamer for tigers. I was put into a, a dance, went out on stage without even having one rehearsal or one dance lesson. <laughs> so I did other things besides that, but slowly my, my uh, fan letters started waning and I knew I had to do something else. So I came up with this idea to see if what Jules Verne had written about, this fictional account of going around the world in 80 days, if it was humanly possible. And I asked Mr. Pulitzer if I could do this. He said, oh, that's a wonderful idea. We've already thought of it. But you know we would have to send a man. We couldn't send you. And I said, well, why? Well, they said because a woman would require a lot of trunks with all that she would have to pack for her changes. And she would have to have a chaperone. All this would slow her down. So of course we'd have to send a man. And I said, if you do, then I will go to work for one of your competitors and I will beat any man that you sent. Before our conversation ended, they said if they did it, that I would be the one that they would send. It took them over a year before they finally decide to do it. But I set out with one grip sack and the clothes on my back. That's all I took with me on my round-the-world trip. I left Hoboken, New Jersey, new, in New York Harbor there, on November the 14th of 1889. Crossing the Atlantic Ocean on the Augusta Victoria, it took us a little over a week to get there, so I arrived in Southampton on November the 21st. And I was met there by an agent of the newspaper who escorted me on to London. He told me that if I went slightly out of my way, that I could actually meet Jules Verne and his wife. And of course, I said I would go without food, without sleep, whatever it took to be able to do that. So I did. I went across the English Channel on down to Calais, where I met Mr. Verne and his wife in Amiens. I had a wonderful time chatting with them, but of course, our time was brief. So I then boarded our train on down through the Alps, where we went and ended up there in Brindisi in Italy, and then across the Mediterranean down to Port Said in Egypt. We were fueled there, and then on down through the Suez Canal. And of course, at this time, people did not travel around the world except for the very wealthy. And then they took months to do it. So I was able to relate to them stories such as watching the little boys jumping for coins, naked little boys. And they could only use their mouth for their pouches as they dove into the waters to get more coins as we made our way then on down to Colombo in Ceylon. From Ceylon, we went on then to Singapore. In Singapore, I went home with a rickshaw driver, and he had a pet monkey, and I asked if I could buy him. His name was McGinty, so I took him on with me. From Singapore, we went to Hong Kong, and in Hong Kong, that was where I discovered that there was another woman traveling around the world the opposite way. She had left Elizabeth Bislin, who was employed by Cosmopolitan. She had left the exact same day I had, but going the opposite way around the world. Oh, I was so afraid that I was going to lose. And they said that she was going to beat me because she had a head start. Well, I had nothing to do while I waited to go to Yokohama because we had five days, so I went on to Canton. On Christmas Day, then, I went to the execution grounds. Not a good thing to do on Christmas. But then I boarded the ship there, and we set sail for Yokohama. Yokohama, I enjoyed very much Japan. I loved the Japanese people. They were beautiful. I went to a geisha house there. But when we boarded the ship then, the Oceanic, to cross across the Pacific Ocean, we were afraid we were behind. And, and they wanted to make sure that I, I beat Elizabeth Bislin, so they tried as hard as they could. But there were all sorts of squalls that we met there. They said there was a Jonah on board. 
there was someone who was something that was unlucky, and they blamed it on McGinty, my monkey, and they wanted me to throw him overboard. And I said, well, some people think ministers are unlucky, so if you throw ministers overboard that are on the ship, then I will throw McGinty over, which, of course, saved McGinty's life. When we arrived at San Francisco, it took two searches before they finally found the Bill of Health. They would not allow us to come into port without it. I was ready to jump off the ship and swim. There had been a blizzard in the Sierra Nevadas, my route that had originally been planned. So instead, the world chartered a train for me that went on down through the Sierra, uh, on down through the uh, Mojave Desert, through um, across then down through the south, and up through Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. And so I arrived back in Hoboken, New Jersey, there in New York City on January 25th of 1890. It had taken me 72 days, 4 hours, 11 minutes, and 14 seconds to do that. When I arrived, there was a cable from Jules Verne congratulating me on my feat that I had done. As it turned out, I was four days ahead of Elizabeth Bislin. As I have always said and believed, energy rightly applied and directed will accomplish anything, and I did. I'm here with our guest, Miss Nellie Bly. Miss Bly, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of what I know is a busy schedule and being with us here today. Well, you're welcome. Um, I was listening to your uh, talk earlier, and uh, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions, certainly about your uh, your around the world trip. I mean, you've got your your grip sack here, uh, and that's all you took with you. That's it, and, and that's the clothes you, I had on my back. And you operated out of this for 72 days. Mm -hmm. I have to ask you, what's in there? What did you take with you on your trip? Oh, I'll be happy to show you. Are you sure? Oh, yes. Now, some of these things are unmentionables, but I had well, my, I night mention them. <laughs> <laughs> my nightgown, obviously, and bodice, my soap, some undergarments. <laughs> Gilly hat. I took two of these actually. A tennis jacket. A pad of paper. Obviously, I had to use it for reporting. Mm -hmm. And with that, I had my, my pens and my ink. Pencils. My flask for water, of course. Mm -hmm. Thread and pins and needles in case I had to repair anything. And then I had my veils and hankies and drinking glass and slippers. And of course, the bane of my existence. Oh, 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 here's more underwear. The bane of my existence, as I started to say, my cold cream. Uh -huh. I never knew what kind of weather I was going to encounter, so I thought I'd better have this with me. And as it turned out, I realized I'd packed too much because I could have purchased anything anywhere along the way. I, I, was gonna say, I guess mm. it would have been easier to, to lay your hands on cold cream and some places rather than other places. And clothing as well. I could have had it washed there by the, the different merchants set up to clean clothes or purchase more too. Hmm. Uh, what, did, what have you been doing since your around the world uh, stunt? I mean, didn't they oh, call that things? a stunt? Or was that the, the Yes, term? they called a stunt journalist. I was the first and the best. Before I started, there were really not any women journalists to speak of, so I was one of the first. But um, they didn't think that it was proper for a woman to be involved in this because the, the newspaper men, they were known for their swearing and smoking and, of course, chewing tobacco and spitting in the spittoon. So they didn't want a woman to be exposed to this or actually be part of them. I was not readily accepted in the newsrooms, but they got used to me after a while. I don't, I don't what, mean to put you on the spot, but how did you, did you get along Ultimately, how did you feel about your male 
colleagues. Did you get along well with them? It took a while, really? but yes. Eventually, like I said, they accepted me. Hmm. There were some I got along better with others, just mm -hmm. as it is in real life, right. outside of the newsroom. Uh, who were some of your favorite people to interview, if I can ask? Well, Susan B. Anthony. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed interviewing her because I was very, um, not involved in the suffrage movement, but I, I respected her highly. And I thought that she, unlike many of the suffragettes and suffragists who dress like men, she always looked very comely. She put on beautiful clothes and makeup and used the assets that God had given her. She said that I had asked her questions no one else had ever asked her, such as, have you ever been in love? She said, yes, she had many times, but she had never loved a man enough to want to become his servant. <laughs> um, Jack Dempsey, I got to actually spar with him. And, well, how did that go? Uh, well, he didn't knock me out. I <laughs> did go that far. <laughs> but it was interesting anyway. <laughs> now, you asked me before what I had done after my around-the-world trip. Mm -hmm. uh, when I returned, I... Um, got back to the New World, the, the New York World newspaper, assuming they would give me a raise or a cho choice assignment, but I got nothing, no accolades of any kind, so I quit. Really? I did. And I started doing a series of, of talks about my trip around the world, and then I was hired to write novels. But I became very ill and was not able to follow through with this. It, they were penny novels. Eventually, then, I was hired on as a reporter for my friend Arthur Brisbane, and that was when I went to the Wilson's inaugural uh, parade, mm -hmm. and I reported on the, the Democratic and the Republican conventions, as well as the suffrage conventions, and I met my husband, Robert Siemens, and gave up reporting for a while while I was married to him. Mm -hmm. We traveled, and then I eventually, after he passed away, I took over his ironclad manufacturing company. Um, in that, I attained patents to have the very first milk, steel milk container that was produced, was under my patent. I trusted my managers, who I should not have, who embezzled from me. And I was in Austria seeking a friend of mine, Oscar Bondi, if he could give me funds to be able to get the company out of bankruptcy when the Great War broke out. I again contacted my friend Arthur Brisbane, who worked then for the Evening Journal in New York, and he hired me as a war correspondent there. I was the very first war correspondent on the Eastern Front, reporting from the trenches. Hmm. Well, at, at this point, I want to say that this is not actually Nellie Bly. Okay. This is actually Joanne Peterson from Kingwood, and hmm. uh, Joanne, thanks for coming all the way down from Preston County with us oh, today. Oh, you're welcome. And, uh, Joanne is one of our most experienced uh, History Lab presenters, having uh, pr uh, portrayed uh, uh, several uh, figures Jenny in the Lind, past. Mary Jenny Lincoln, Lynn, Mary Lincoln. And you make me sound old. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. no I, that's certainly not my intention. But uh, I want to ask you here real quick, what was it about Nellie Bly that made you, that compelled you to want to portray her and, and, and research and study more about her? Well, with any character, there's always something about them that draws you to them. I was at the museum in Washington, D.C., and they were doing this 3D video, and this one little bubble popped up, and they started talking about Nellie Bly and doing the undercover reporter and being one of the very first in the world. And I just thought, what a gutsy woman. And it, it just clicked. My husband turned to me, and she says, she's going to be one of your characters, isn't she? I said, oh, I think so. Hey, were you <laughs> not really aware of her? Before? I was not. Yeah. That was the first I had heard of her. Yeah, I mean, yeah. she was one of those... You know the name, or at least I knew the name, but I wasn't really sure that I knew why I knew the name. Well, that's the pen name. Her real name was Elizabeth right. Jane Cochran. Right. And she was uh, she was from Pennsylvania. She was born in Apollo, Pennsylvania. Well, actually, Cochran's Mill, Pennsylvania. It was named after her father and then moved as a young girl to Apollo, Pennsylvania. I wanted to ask you, I meant to ask you this. Uh, <clears throat> did she, when she was coming back and came into Pittsburgh, did she... Cross through West Virginia at all in her? No, she didn't. Uh, I'm shucks. sorry. I didn't think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a, a certain claim to fame. Uh, so tell me a little bit about your your research. You know, what were some of your sources? How did you go about uh, pulling together information to well, I, I went, formulate your, yeah, your portrayal? I went to the historical society there in the county where she lived there in Vandegrift, and uh, they showed me a, a lot of the newspaper clippings and and 
things related to her that they had there. I also have gone to New York City and took the book that was written by her primary biographer, Brooke Kroger, and went to every single place where she had lived in New York City. She started up in, in the Bronx area and kept moving closer to Midtown when she was married to Robert Seaman, who was a millionaire. So she was living in pretty posh way there. Mm -hmm. But I have gone also to um, where she died, where the hospital was, where her service was held at the church, and I've been to her funeral home, as well as to Blackwell's Island, which is now Roosevelt Island, just off. And the only thing that's remaining of the insane asylum is the tower. But it just gives you, you know, you stand there and you look over and realize just across the river was freedom for these women. And it gives you a whole different perspective on that. I've also done a transatlantic cruise, which went in out of Southampton, and I've been to London. So I've seen some of the sites that she saw along the way. Um, that always helps me with my character to put myself in their shoes to see what they did to experience things that they may have experienced. Some of the same things that they did. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, well, and there's also in there. A, there's a Nellie Bly website, uh, uh, NellieBlyOnline.com, which will connect you to a number of the newspaper articles that she wrote. Although they're, right. you know, microfish size, <laughs> they need to be blown up to be able to be read. But also, one thing interesting about her was that Nellie didn't just write about the news; she became the news. So she put herself in. Every story, you saw it through her eyes, you felt her emotions as you did it. So when she wrote Around the World in 72 Days, 10 Days in a Madhouse, uh, Five Months in Mexico, she wrote everything from first person, which makes it wonderful for a portrayer <laughs> to, to be well, able to, to step into her shoes because you actually experienced it through her eyes. Do you think she has she sort of achieved maybe some posthumous uh, recognition that she She was one of the four gain? female journalists that was put on postage stamps. She also, in the, the Broadway show Newsies, was the model for the female investigative reporter in that. There was a movie made a little less than two years ago called Ten Days in a Madhouse. Linda Pearl was in a movie that was about her life. And of course, um, 72 Days, Around the World in 72 Days, The American Experience is a great resource, too, to learn more about her, as is Around 80 Days, Nellie Bly and Elizabeth Bislin, it talks about both of them and around the world and what they achieved in their lives. Nellie's life afterward was not quite as exciting. Um, Elizabeth Bislin did become a very well-published novelist in her own right and had a happy life. Hmm. And here in the last... They're buried in the same cemetery, too, by the way, which I've been really? to. Mm -hmm. um, here in the, in the last few seconds we have, uh, briefly tell us uh, about the end of her life. She died of pneumonia in New York City. And this was in She was only when? 57 years old. 19. 1922. So only, I portray her in 1920, so only two years later she passed away. In that time she became an advice columnist and she started matching young children with um, people to adopt them and she took a girl in herself. She also was an advocate for semen. <coughs> thinking that the English had taken away a lot of the seamen's work. Mm -hmm. And so they honored her, too, with a statue. Okay. Well, I want to thank you, Joanne Peterson, for being here and portraying Nellie Bly. And thank you for tuning in to History Alive.